Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. Today we're talking to Fraser Vimeri, aka Eduardo Riches, about his uh, excellent new book, Food on Gnosticism. Uh, for those watching at home, uh, you will see the link going across the screen. Definitely pick it up. For anybody listening, I'm going to put the link into the show notes below. Uh, you can also go to Eduardo's homepage, which is eduardoregis.com. Very easy to understand and remember. Eduardo, I often praise our guests and their work, and some, sometimes I feel like I sound like a phony. But the thing is, I only interview people that I love. And this book is so great. I, I highly recommend it to anyone who has even a little bit of interest in the topic because, and, and this is not meant as an insult, it's uh, meant as a compliment. It's short, it's well written, it's easy to understand. These are rare things in the occult and magical and Gnostic worlds, period. And I think also rare things in this subset uh, of Voodoo Gnosticism, because anybody out there who has also tried to read uh, the Voodoo Gnostic workbook knows that it can be pretty challenging. Again, folks, pick up this book, treat yourself, even if you're a little bit curious. Eduardo, like I was saying beforehand, I don't, we just usually dive right in. And I'm going to dive in with an almost impossible question, which is, can you give us the elevator pitch, a sort of short version of what Gnostic Voodoo is? Okay, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. I'm so happy to talk to you. I'm so happy to talk to all of you that uh, are listening now. I'm sorry if my English is not uh, very good, but I guess it will have to do. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds perfect. Sounds perfect. Uh, thanks. <laughs> you really just asked me like an impossible question, but I'll try to do something. Yeah. So what in... in what would be a summary of what is the doom Gnosticism? What would be a good definition of it? Actually, it's quite debatable because the doom Gnosticism is a very plastic system that encompasses a lot of ideas, a lot of magical currents. Okay, I'm gonna say something here, and maybe my neighbor will disagree with me, and that's perfectly fine. <laughs> But I guess in a nutshell, it would be like a magic system that is permeated with a lot of different influences. A magic system that is so plastic, and it's meant to be that plastic because it's like it's if you are children playing with with some building blocks, you have to be able to build anything that you imagine with it. So this magic system has to be a really, like I said, plastic. And it may seem to some people that it, because of that, it is confusion. And I, I'm jumping ahead, but <laughs> the discussion, but you mentioned already the Voodoo Gnostic, Gnostic Workbook by Michael Bertio, which is like the Bible here in this topic. And if you don't know it yet, I Rightly recommend you to get a copy, but it can be a challenging book. It can be a very challenging book because it, it's big. It's not written in a traditional way. It's a series of lessons and it doesn't give you too much of a context. You have to really get to other sources to get context. And it's, it is a good thing, but maybe not for beginners. Yeah. Maybe not for those who are just getting in touch with that system. So all this. I would say all this gigantic system and gigantic roads with all those possibilities, you may just freeze. Where should I go? What should I do? What should I read? And in that, there is also that also lies the beauty of the system. Because when you finally realize where you should go next, what you should do next, and spoiler alert, no one will tell you exactly when or what you should do next. You, you should discover it yourself. But when you do realize that, then you start to understand, oh, okay, this is why it is so big. This is why it's so rich. So again, it's a magic system. It's a magic system to help people build their own magical path and magical tools. It, it, it would be the most, I guess, short definition that I could give to anyone that is just, I don't know, maybe people watching have never heard about it. So for someone who I just met on the street and would ask me that, 
I would primarily say something like that. Okay. Yeah. So, it, and, 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 I'm sorry, but it's important to to talk about that. It's important to tell that it is a magic system, a magical system, because of the name Voodoo Gnostic. Uh, but in in that name, what what people will, will see first, will notice first, is the Voodoo word. Always the Voodoo word will be the the star of, of of the name and of course voodoo is strictly related to religion we all know that maybe we don't know voodoo very well maybe we only have heard about it like slightly or read about it in some pages and we don't have the exact idea of what voodoo is but we know that voodoo is related to religion and somehow related to african religions and people that come to this book and maybe on a bookstore and see the title, maybe they will think, oh, that's something to do with religion. Maybe I open here or get some, some spells from Africa or from Jamaica or something like that. And it's not the case. We're not dealing with religion. We're not talking about the Voodoo Gnostic system dealing with a magical system so that's why it's so important to emphasize that <laughs> yes excellent I, I think that's a, a very clear description and we pride ourselves on we have a real mix of of audience so we have scholars we have uh practitioners we have the curious spiritual seekers we have experts so i i think this explanation is really clear to whoever whatever is watching listening what inspired you to write this book Honestly, my own confusion, <laughs> my very own confusion, because as maybe the majority of the people who started dealing with the Vudum Gnostic system, I started with the Vudum Gnostic workbook. I bought it, I started to read it, and I found it very difficult to comprehend. At the same time, very mesmerizing calling to me. I would read it and put it aside. I'm not understanding it, but the idea of getting the book again and reading again would would return, would visit me again and again. So I, I would go back to the book. And when I started to work with the, the Vodou Gnostic system officially, like on the Otoa or Ordo Temple Oriented Antiqua, with some pronunciations may seem strange to the English speaker, so I'm sorry. But uh, then I had to face it. <laughs> and I started to talk to my, uh, to my tutor. So, and he started to give me some keys to understand it. And then I was like, those are very good keys to understand it. So why don't we show people <laughs> that there are some keys that can help you? They're not the only keys around. I bet there are a, an infinite number of keys around. And I'm not claiming to have the, the secret to understand it like in truth that's not what it is about it is a way to understand it it's a way to read it and those keys gave me that and of course during the studies and the practices i also developed my very own keys so i started to write in order to communicate with my initiator because we had the dynamic i do something i write a report and send to him and he he got back to me and started to write. And then I was like, I don't know, I was taken by something. I, I, I will not say that something purely spiritual or magical, but it was something also spiritual and magical. And when it was done, I showed it to my initiator and he said, yeah, we got to put that in the world. And it was like that. It was my own confusion, my own way of understanding what I was dealing with uh, and, and of course it's a limited way of understanding it because everyone should develop their own way and has to develop their own way because I can't give my keys to anyone else and expect them to make fully sense perfect sense and the idea of sharing the book it was to make people's lives easier when reading the Dumnosco workbook and other works 
from BTO, which I mean, which, which are great. I have nothing but love and respect for BTO, but again, can be challenging for beginners. That's it. And that was the idea to share that, to help people's lives in doing that. And also to, to, to see what kind of movement it would, it would get triggered by, by the book. Maybe people will start to, to work on the magical current. Maybe some people will tell me that I'm wrong and this kind of discussions that I feel it's great. So that was the, the, the whole idea. Excellent. We talk a, a lot about uh, figures like uh, Martinez de Pasquale here on the show, uh, uh, about the, the early French Gnostic Church. Uh, I belong to uh, a modern Gnostic Church. It has its lineages back to the French Gnostic Church. Can you tell us a bit about the legendary history of the Gnostic Voudon system and its connections and ties to people like Pasquale to the early French Gnostic movement? Sure. It is quite a history. It's a history that encompasses a lot of characters that are enshrouded in mystery, <laughs> in a lot of mystery. As you said, Martinez de, de Pasquale, which is a guy that you talk a lot in, in the show, and for a good reason, <laughs> because it's very important to what we have today in the Western esotericism tradition. And Pasquale is a very mysterious character. I know some people hear Osborne talk about him so much better than I could ever try to. But the thing about Pasquale is that later in his life, he went to San Domingue, which now is Haiti. He went there. History goes that he went there to, to take care of some business involving properties and some money from his wife's side of the family, you know? Then, then he went there, he stood there for two, three years, and then he died there. And people say it probably died from yellow fever or something like that. But at the time, it was very common for Europeans to get, get those diseases and die there. You know? So that's the official history that we have. But there are some details in that history. Pasquale went there for what would be like a short trip, maybe it's a business trip. I'll go there, see some papers, get some things done, and we return to France. And But he stayed there for two, three years. And we can start to imagine what kind of legal problems would have kept him for two, three years in the island. It's not impossible, maybe. It was something legal, it was something bureaucratic, maybe, not impossible, but Okay, a year earlier from the arrival of Pasquale on the island, his cousin, which was also in the army, went to the island. So he had his cousin there already. So it's somebody went first, then he goes. Okay, and when you talk to some people, especially people connected to the Haitian side of Martinism and the Gnostic Church, and, and they do not talk a lot, <laughs> so it's hard to catch them and to hear something from them. But when you do, some of them, the vast majority maybe, will tell you that Pasquale went there and he founded some temples there. He, he went there, got in touch with the Maison, Freemasonry lodges there, because there were many on Saint Domingue. It was like Freemasonry was like, a, I don't know, a hobby for the Europeans there, that it was like plantations and farms and maybe some small cities, they wouldn't have m much to do. <laughs> and maybe Freemasonry started to be like an interesting activity. So there were, there were a lot of Freemasonry lodges there. So Pasquale would have got in touch with those lodges and he would have founded some Ilukoen temples there. And then he started to spread his spiritual lineage in, in, in what would become Haiti. And some people say also that Pasquale went there. Maybe the history of the story of the money and properties are, were real. Maybe it was real. But he was also interested, some people say, 
in understanding how the people from San Domingue, how they mastered the technology of getting in touch with spirits. We know that Pasquale was very interested in that kind of thing. It's no, <laughs> no surprise for anyone who remotely have heard or have read something about Pasquale. So some people say that his cousin went, maybe he wrote him a letter. Whoa, Pasquale, let me tell you something. There are some people here who does amazing stuff with spirits. They call the spirits, the, the spirits come to them, they inhabit their bodies, and they do some amazing stuff here. You would love to see that. And maybe he was like, maybe I will. <laughs> And then that's all the, the kind of uh, ideas that people have about what Pasquale was doing there. So the, the idea is Pasquale went there and somehow he left Mark. He left his spiritual lineage there. And this spiritual lineage somehow got mixed with what the people of the island were doing. Because it's only natural. If you should go to some place and you start teaching them some spiritual philosophy, you're not finding a blank sheet. People are already with their stuff on their minds. People had already their own spiritual practice. Nowadays, we see on the Haitian Freemason, Freemasonry a lot of influence from Haitian voodoo, for example. So the same would have happened to the Elikoen and the other Pasquale's philosophies, especially in, the, in a particular family called the Jamain family. The Jamain family, some say that they were enslaved people that belonged to Pasquale there. Some say that it was another story. We don't know uh, precisely what happened, but they were like um, voodoo priests. And they also drank from that fountain that Pasquale offered. And so it started the mixing of the elements. And it is precisely the Jean-Main family that will start this Voodoo Gnostic current, more specifically, Lucien François Jean-Main, and later his son, his son, Hector Jean-Main, who, Hector, who is the guy who will initiate later Michael Bertio. And then Michael Bertiu, an American citizen, he will bring it back to the U.S. and start to write some things, start to give some correspondence courses. Back at the time, on the 70s, it was very common. Right? You, you would buy some magazines, some occult magazines, and at the end of then there would be some flyers telling, well, are you interested in the occult? Write this address. And so he started doing that thing. And... His contribution will later take shape in the Vudung Gnostic workbook, which we have talked about a lot. And Michael Bertio actually continues to produce a lot of a lot of good stuff. He has written a lot of books and is as as far as I know, he is writing as we're speaking now, he's writing new books. Oh. And he's in his early nineties, right? So yeah, he's like 95, 93, uh -huh. I'm not sure. But yeah, yeah, he could have retired by now. <laughs> he, his, he, his contribution is um, gigantic, so he doesn't have to prove anything else to anyone. But he continues to work, he continues to write, he continues to produce his art. And so he's a very interesting character. Yeah. So that's what connects to Pasquale. But also the idea of the Gnostic Church, and more specifically the early French Gnostic Church, like with Jude Donnell, there is a connection in there. Of course, there is a connection from lineages, you know, the guy who initiates another, and so, and so it, it ends with, with Bertio, of course. But it is more like a connection of methods, because what Donnell... What happened to Donnell? He, he, he received the, the visitation of some spirits who told him, you should, you should rekindle the Gnostic Church. Go ahead. Do it anew. Go. And he did it. <laughs> so this spirit interaction, it, it is the key, or at least one of the 
very important keys in the Voodoo Gnostic system. And this is how Bertio has worked most of the time. If you get his books, more precisely, Voodoo Cartography and Ontological Graffiti, like two incredible and excellent books, but others, you will see how his method was, I'm not sure if he's doing the same by nowadays exactly, but I believe it's something very, if not similar, at least that evolved from that, so it's connected. And it was all about interaction with the spirits. It was all about calling the spirits or receiving message from the spirits and developing those ideas that the spirits passed on, working on that and calling the spirits again and making more questions and showing them more stuff and getting more answers. And so this was how he built everything that he showed us with in his works. So that's, uh, it's very important to understand that. And also Pasquale had also this thing to call spiritual entities, spiritual denizens of the spiritual world. And through, maybe you guys have seen it, his sigils, you can find it at the Angelic books. His sigils are complex, intricate sigils. And some people have suggested that some of those sigils are derived from Haitian voodoo veves, which are the sigils from the Haitian voodoo. We do not have uh, concrete proof, concrete evidence for that, but maybe, or maybe because when you contact the invisible world, it doesn't matter where you are, who you are, maybe you will receive some things that are in common. So there are a lot of possibilities uh, that we can bring up to the table. But the fact is, we're talking about this idea of dealing directly with the invisible world. So I guess that's what connects it. So staying on the question about Gnosticism, and we'll talk about this probably more in the next question. We, we, we already explain quite well that this is not a, a religion, it's a system of magic that draws on a whole wide range of influences. So it's not a, a sect of Gnosticism by any means. Mm -hmm. But you do recommend that people read about the classical Gnosticism of the early centuries if they want to go further into the system, know more. And, and there are at least some similarities. Like, where do you see the Gnostic Vudon system lining up with Gnostic movements, especially Valentinianism? Yeah, it's also a, a very difficult question to answer, but no, I'm here for it. Let's do it. Yeah, I do recommend in the book that the people should read and study more about Gnosis movements. And I know that this is like asking maybe too much because it would take a lifetime to understand them all, to read about them all. And of course, that's not what I'm asking. I'm not asking anyone to become an expert on anything. But you should at least know something. You should at least understand that Gnosticism is a very heterogeneous thing. There is not one Gnostic movement. You should at least understand that, that there are some differences and some characteristics of the major Gnostic movements, I would say. Maybe you should understand it. And why? To better understand how Bertio lays the Vudung Gnostic system because he does use a lot of terms and ideas that are derived from some Gnostic sources, especially Valentinian Gnosticism, like Eons, Sizix, Monads, Veroma, I'm not sure. Like all, all this, it can be really challenging to someone who does not have an idea of what this is, this is that have never read about anything, doesn't know what a, a pleroma is, or doesn't have an idea of CZG is, to go and dive into the system without knowing exactly what those terms mean. And I know that does, these meanings can vary a little bit, I know that, but at least you can understand the core idea around it and then you will be able to read what Bertio is writing 
and understand how Bertio is using it. Because he does not, I would say, he does not care about using it like modifications. He may, he takes the terms and sometimes make their own. Make the, the terms, the, their own terms. He, he modifies a little bit the ideas. If you, if you ask me if there is a the, uh, direct relationship, ah, if I could put the Valentinian Gnosticism on one side and Voodoo Gnosticism on the other side, do they mirror each other? No, they don't mirror each other. There are some very important differences, but there are some structures from the Gnosticism, especially Valentinian Gnosticism, that are used by Bertio, like the idea of the Paroma, the Monads, the emanations from the One, the idea of the Eons and their union as Sisig, and how this is the whole of the spiritual world. And, and you start to, to make other connections, like you see the idea of Sophia and the fall of Sophia, and you see how the material world came to be, and Pasquale was not telling exactly that, but something like that, something like that. And so you started to see how everything somehow connects and what uh, he's, he, he's pointing you to, Bertio is pointing you to, is, well, we are here. We recognize that there is a spirit world, an invisible world that is rich, that contains a lot more than anyone can ever imagine or know about. And we aim to making contact. We aim to enter in some kind of harmony with that. Through what? Through what we could call Gnosis. Gnosis, or in a, the translation of Gnosis is always tricky, always tricky. I don't recommend if you're listening and if you don't know what Gnosis is, so go and try to find what Gnosis is exactly. <laughs> And because it's not a knowledge in the rational sense, it's not only a feeling, it's not only a sensation, it is something much more deep. It's what connects, connects you to this divine and spiritual world. It is also not what I have been, or lately I have been seeing some people using the term as meaning trance. Oh, I enter Gnosis. I am in a trance. So it's not, we're not talking about it. It's something different. It's not a trance. Trance can be a part of it. Okay. Trance can be a part of the methods, can be a way for you to, to open your channels, to achieve some results, to achieve some understanding. I'm not against trance, but Gnosis is not really trance. It's something much more deeper. And you have to make a tremendous effort. You have to study. You have to practice. You have to make a lot of developments in order to maybe get closer to that state of, as I would say. And the Voodoo Gnostic system he is all shaped around this idea that you have to get in touch with stuff. You have to get in contact with stuff. It's through that living experience that somehow you can achieve that state. So that's why it's very important to know a little bit about what the Gnostic movements and currents were and to understand what they were doing and what we are doing is not the same necessarily. There are some similarities but not the same, and to understand what they presented us, what they gave us, and what we are using now, what we took from them in a good way. Well, this is good, so let's use it. So this is, this is why it is important to read all those books about the Gnosticism and try to understand it. Now, actually, I do give... Uh, a very large list of things people should read. 
And it's, I know that this part maybe will be intimidated into some, what? I should read all of this, Gnosticism, philosophy, religion. And again, it's a lifetime's work. The same as if you are, if you're dreaming about achieving something similar to a state of Gnosis, it is at least one lifetime's work, at least. So you don't have to be afraid of it. You just go in your own pace in your own time, doing your stuff with care, with passion, not hurrying. And if we do that, I guess the trip will be more enjoyable. <laughs> and when the trip is enjoyable, the trip is good. Yes, the results will also be better. So that's the idea of that list of recommendations. Not something that you should know before getting uh, your foot on the road, but something you should some knowledge you should acquire while on the roads. And of course, I'm telling people to read that. And of course, I, I have not, I am not the master of it all. I don't know everything about the Gnosticism or the philosophy, philo philosophical authors or religion. That would be crazy if I said so. Imagine, no, I know everything. I have, no, I'm, I know very little, but I'm on the road, <laughs> the road. We all are on the road. Yeah, exactly. I've been reading about Gnosticism for, for 30 years now, and I still don't know what it is. So yeah, <laughs> I, I'm on the road. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you explain the difference between Voodoo Gnosticism and Haitian Voodoo, while also exploring the, the connections between them. So can you talk about these this relationship between the two traditions and the influence of Haitian Voodoo on, on Gnostic Voodoo? And, and, and of course, some of that you've already emphasized, that they are not the same thing. So if you could explain that to us. Yeah. So I will emphasize again, they are not the same thing. And why I'm doing it again, and I will do it again, probably before we end this, this chat here, because it's a very common confusion. And I understand why. It's because of the terms. Okay. It, no one has to know anything about Haitian voodoo or the differences. It's a very uh, niche thing. So. Uh, of course, I do know about Haitian voodoo because I am a priest of Haitian voodoo, a priest of voodoo, you know? So I do love Haitian voodoo. I studied a lot. I have books on it on Portuguese only for now. But I know that for the majority of people out there, Haitian voodoo is equal black magic in the most full of prejudice sense of it. So that's why I'm using the term black magic. But no, it's not. So let me talk about a little bit Haitian Voodoo first. Haitian Voodoo is a very beautiful, complex religion that was born in what we call now Haiti, the, the country of Haiti. It's a religion that deals with also contacting the spirit realm, about talking to the Loas, the spirits of Haitian Voodoo, of interacting with them. It's a religion that by no means is interested in doing evil or in harming people. It's a religion that it's all about taking care of community, of living a, your life the best way possible, of understanding some mysteries in this universe. So if you think Haitian voodoo is all about those voodoo dolls that you pin them or zombies, you are wrong. But you know what? It's not your fault because it, Hollywood, fiction, you name it, sold that idea to us. It's not true. So if you're interested in Asian voodoo, I do recommend that you get some books about it, books by some good authors, and you understand what it is really. And that's what I just said, beautiful and very community centric religion. Okay. And I use religion here for lack of a better word, because when you talk about religion, we do think about the West, Western idea of religion. And this is religion is something that we do in our private lives. I go to my job like eight hours. And when I'm off the clock, I go to the church, I go to the mass or no one has to know it. I won't discuss it with anyone. 
it's it's all it's only my thing. But when we do look at non-Western view of religion, you know, of course I'm, I'm not talking specifically here because there are a lot of different views in the East and the African countries, but in general, that religion is something so entwined to the daily life, to the community, to your routine actions, that the word religion that we have here in the West is not good. <laughs> it's not good enough, but we don't have another word. So religion it is. And so how did that religion influence the Voodoo Gnostic system? That, then we go back to that story about uh, Lucien François Germain that came from a family of priests, Haitian Voodoo priests. And when he received all that knowledge from the Pasquale, from Martinists, and from other currents, magical currents, he started making like something of an esoteric Haitian voodoo, we could say. There is in Haiti today uh, some currents of Haitian voodoo that are more esoteric, but nothing like the voodoo gnostic system, like a magical system. You know, within the religion, there are some who carry a more esoteric view of the religion, with more inner mysteries, with some teachings that are more um, secret, with some ideas that are more elaborated, more connected to some esoteric thinkers, you know? I, I would say that they are not the majority. I would say that they are not the majority, but they, they do exist. And so what Lucien François Germain or and some people for sure before him were already doing, was mixing, was taking those ideas, this, those esoteric and magical ideas, and applying it to their own lives. And when they started to apply that magical philosophies, magical practices, esotericist practices in their own daily lives, they had to somehow confront it in a good way also with Haiti and Voodoo, because that was the religion, that was their life. And so it started to blend somehow. So from that, the Voodoo Gnostic system was born with a lot of influences from Haitian Voodoo. For example, we do have some spirits of the Haitian Voodoo that will be also worked on the Voodoo Gnostic system in a magical approach, in a different approach than we use when we are doing Haitian voodoo. It's different stuff. Oh, but the spirits are the same. Yeah, but the approach is different. Some ideas also, some notions from voodoo also, they also came to the voodoo gnostic system, but we do use them in our own way. So it is, that's why it's important to emphasize again and again. They are not the same thing, but they are related somehow. And I know that some people from the Haitian voodoo com com uh, community, sorry, <laughs> they, uh, they sometimes criticize the voodoo gnostic system because of that. Ah, oh, because it's not voodoo, it's not Haitian voodoo, it's something else. Yeah, it is something else. It's not meant to be Haitian voodoo. It was never meant to be Haitian voodoo. Bertio that wrote about it to the world never said, at least I couldn't find, maybe if someone <laughs> can find, it, it can, can show us, but I could never find. Bertio never wrote that his system was equal to Haitian voodoo, never. So no one ever said that. So again, the confusion, we understand it, but different stuff. And the Voodoo Gnostic system, they, it has so much more other influences, like from the Nordic religions, like from Golden Dawn, Ma, you name it, a lot of different influences. So we could never say that the, this system, this magical system that is so plastic, 
could be restrained to a religion, whatever religion it may be, or to a magical current, whatever magical current it may be. That's why we don't say, oh, some people in the Voodoo Gnostic system are Thelemites. Thelemites. We don't say that the Voodoo Gnostic system is. It's, it, he, you can use these magical currents in your work if you want to. Okay, no problem. Go ahead. No problem. But you also can ignore it. No, it's not for me. You know, no. So we cannot uh, reduce the system to anything. It is a thing of its own. And that's why it's so beautiful. And as I said, also so complex to understand. Getting more into some of these complexities and influences, but reading the Bertio's Gnostic Voodoo workbook, it, it can read like science fiction. It has a lot of wild concepts in there. Just off the top of my head, and you talk about this in your book as well, we have uh, Atlantis, we have time travel, we have trans-Yugothian weird spiders, we uh, we have voodoo tronics, we got magical cyborgs, and the list goes on. And the HP Lovecraft entities... You mentioned how one should use Gnostic Voodoo to build one's own personal system and their own magical universe. So is mm -hmm. this, are all these influences this sort of sci-fi? Is that what it's there for, to, to help you expand your mind, to help you build this really creative magical universe? Why is that stuff in there? Is it literally true? I guess I have a few questions in here. Is that stuff literally <laughs> true? And then how can I use this system to build my own magical system? And can I put in my own sci-fi concepts? Can, can, can you walk me through this? this and then again, this is a very complex question. <laughs> yeah, sure. I guess all questions are complex today. But yeah. uh, let's face it. Okay. Yeah, there are a lot of terms and ideas in the Musk work, but that feels like they jumped out of a sci-fi page when it came alive. What I'm reading about aliens and other and empires in other universes, and like you said, weird spiders, time travelers, and what this is all about. First of all, this is, again, I believe, this is the, the manner that Virtue arranged his thing, arranged this thing, okay? So it shows all of Virtue's influences. It shows everything that he had in his mind and his spirit, and he's putting it in the system and showing us. Maybe some of those terms and maybe some of those ideas will make no sense to you or for me. And again, that's perfectly fine. We don't have to agree. We don't have to see eye to eye in everything. But that's how Bertio expressed his, I would say, art here. It's how he, he, he shaped this thing. The question is, there are a lot of questions, but the next logical question is, can I use it as it is? Or should I build my own playset? And the answer for those two questions, actually two questions, are yes and yes. <laughs> yes and yes. You can use it as it is presented by, by Bertio to us. And of course, if you are beginning, if you are starting an exploration, if you are starting a new path, a map, is all too welcome. You're gonna need a map, otherwise you will be lost. So you can use this map. That Bert Bertio draw. He draw this map. So you can use Bertio's map. But maybe this map will only take you so far. Okay? And this so far could be far enough. It could be, and it could be like, okay, that's where I want to go. That's where I wanted to go. I'm fine here. Okay, great. But once you start with this map and you start walking through the territory, you start to notice some things. Maybe that Bertio didn't notice at first, or you start to understand some experiences a little bit different than he did. You know? And that's 
when you will start to draw your own map. That's when you start to write your own instructions somehow. Oh, that's it. Oh, but I see it. Oh, I understand it more like this than that. No. And then you will start to build your own path and your own magical universe. Of course, it is a long path. It's not easy. It's not overnight. You gotta go. You gotta walk. You gotta burn your fingers. You gotta make mistakes. You gotta maybe take, take some steps back. It's all natural. It's all natural. Maybe you pass some time, like a really long time, like months doing something that you will see that, ah, that's not it. And then you, you rethink your all your steps and your path. It's all part of this work of construction. And we should not be afraid of doing the hard work. We should go and do it. And again, in our own time, in our own way, no worries. And returning to the, the sci-fi and all that stuff in the book. It is there also, I believe, that the, in this case, Bertio and Kenneth Grant they share some similarities in their writing. And maybe that's why Kenneth Grant saw early on the value on Bertio's work. It is written in a way that also is meant to help you open your mind. It's, it's written in a way that may feel weird, that may feel it doesn't make much sense because it's challenging you to bend your ideas, to alter some conceptions you might have, to think again about some stuff. So that's why a book like the Vudung Nosco workbook, you will be returning to it for your entire life. Maybe you will spend five years without opening the book. Maybe. Okay. But then one day you will open it again and you see something that you haven't noticed before and it will blow your mind. At least that's how it works for me. Uh, and and because five years from now, let's say, doing magical work, studying, living, or maybe just living my life, I will be something else entirely. I will have new ideas. I will have new experiences. And when I open that book, I will notice some words or some sentence there that I have never noticed before. Although I read it before, but we know when you read too much, that some sentences just disappear from your mind. Yeah. That's pretty normal, expected. And that is what that that is it that I'm looking for. That's it that that that, that phrase or that idea will challenge you somehow and it will be triggered to do something about it. And you can do, or you can just let it be. Yeah. It's yeah. up to you. Because and if you let it be, you, you, I, I, I'd like to say that you miss uh, the opportunity to ride the wave. The wave came, you can ride the wave. When you ride the wave, it's much better than when you fight against the wave. It's much better. But no worries, because if <laughs> this wave comes and you lose it, Another is coming. Always. Yeah. Always. That's that's something yeah. like it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's an awesome explanation. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I was going to say, I do have tons more questions. I sent you more questions, but obviously, the, the, as people are picking up, this is something that, that we could talk about for the rest of our lives. Uh, but uh, So I should start to wrap up, but, uh, but definitely a question I should have opened with if I wanted to get more more listeners and more hits, Eduardo, but we're a serious <laughs> podcast, but uh, I, I, we got asked about sex magic, right? That That's definitely something that's going to catch people's attention. Uh, so sexual magic, it seems to play an important role in, in Buddha and Gnosticism. You have a uh, 
a chapter about it in your book. So can you tell us about how erotic energies and sexual techniques factor into these magical works that you describe? And most importantly, what advice do you have for approaching this aspect responsibly? Okay, that's a very good question. And also to make a very good, I don't know how to, to say that in English, but when you know, take some part of the podcast and just put it like 30 seconds or one minute, that's it. Thank you. Uh, okay. So let's start with the last part of your question, how to approach it with responsibility and care. The best way to do that, uh, when we're talking about anything that involves sex or maybe the idea of sex, because we will see that sex or magic it, does not equal, does not have to be equal to carnal sex magic to, to do sex with someone or maybe to do sex with yourself. Although to do it yourself is a much uh, less programmatic area. But the first thing is, this is a discussion that should be held by adults mm -hmm. with consent, with consent. Always people should know what they are getting into too. If you're getting into a group that deals with sex magic, you should know it beforehand. You should research it. You should talk to people. You should understand what you are going for. Okay. Doesn't matter what type of sex magic it is. Doesn't matter. You have to be careful, you have to take care of yourself, you have to be informed, and you have to be willing doing that. Okay. So that's the only way to talk about it. That's the only way to do it. And maybe if you buy my book and you are a minor, so because the book's not restricted for adults only, because it does not have anything explicit. And you will see in the book that you people watching us will see in the book that I do not talk about explicit sex magic of carnal sex magic. Maybe if you are a minor reading it, you should be aware what you're reading. You should be aware if you are mature enough, you should maybe ask counsel, adults. That's the right way. Okay. But let's talk about what sex magic is and what it's not. Sex magic, of course, can be about two people having sex and doing it with a magical purpose. What purpose? Whatever. Whatever purpose. Maybe it is to build up some energies to call a spirit. Maybe it's to build, maybe to get a new job. Maybe it's to get into a altered state of consciousness. It's very common to, to use sex magic for that because, of course, the excitement, the orgasm and all of that will send our mind, will send our mind in an altered state for a while. And this state can be used to jump to some realms, to some invisible realms, if you have the right keys and the right methods to do, of course. But when we talk about sex, we're also talking about the idea of union. Of union. And please, we're not talking here about biological genders or anything like that. We're talking about energies. Okay. In summary, we have what we call an active and a passive energy. I think it, those are the best terms that are complementary. No, they... When they unite, they make the whole, they make, there are two halves of something that then we, they unite, they make a whole of it. That's what, for example, in Gnosticism, in the Sisyphus, the eons, when they come together, they form this union. This union is a Sisyphus in summary. And so sex magic can be all about also this union of energies, ideas, maybe spirits and persons that somehow they call to each other. For example, when you do, maybe you are interested in talking to a spirit, maybe you're doing some ritual to talk to a spirit. Maybe this spirit will come and maybe he will like take 
uh, your voice to speak it happens so it is a union it is a union of two things that when they come together they produce a result so sex magic in this idea is very important because we are aiming in the Vodun Gnostic system we're aiming at this union with the spirit realm so we can use this idea of complementary forces complementary energies that can bind together we can use that and also there is this very powerful drive in the human being that is the sexual drive that is involved in a lot of stuff in our lives a lot of biological and also psychological processes in our life in our lives they are they have to do with this sexual drive many people have said have written pages and pages about it freud and so many others so it's not something that we are inventing here <laughs> it is already said and we know that this drive this power this energy can be Harnessed. Harnessed? Yeah, that's it. Yep, harnessed, yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, to a purpose. So you can use, for example, a method of sexual stimulation that can be mental. For example, uh, you can think about uh, your partner that you have an attraction for mm -hmm. he or she. You have an attraction. You can think about your partner this will sexual arouse you and instead of taking this energy and burning it in the sexual act per se you will direct it to a purpose to a magical purpose mm. we all know that it's widely used in magic we see nowadays many people of many chaos magicians doing that to activate sigils. I think it's very common, at least here, I don't know in the rest of the world, but here in Brazil, literally in the last 10 years, I'm getting old, but I guess in the last 10 years, a lot of chaos magicians started to rise and no problem with that. But they were all, they were all talking about the same stuff. It's how to activate sigils and always through sexual energy. And of course, there are other ways. There are other ways, but we will not discuss this. And the point is, Sexual energy is an energy that we are familiar with, that we deal with it uh, our whole life, basically. That we know how we can uh, build it up, that there's no mystery to anyone. So it's, you can use it. So it is important to, to produce your results and also to put you in a state when you are like that, when you build up your sexual energy, you then enter in some state, okay, that you can with more easy uh, make stuff happen or maybe call something. If you arise and you, the, your sexual drive and use all that energy in you know, the intention to maybe, I don't know, call some spirit, this energy will go and it will be like a huge amount of energy in order to make that thing happen. So that's why it is so important. That's why it is discussed. It is, if we go back to the ideas of the Gnostic currents about the, the emanations and all the eons and they are coming together and looking for the complementary and all the idea, it is like it is in there. This idea of things coming together, things coming apart. This is how somehow reality came to be. Things come together, things coming apart. If you understand that we're talking about this kind of stuff and not about parties with people naked in the pool and drinking and... If you like, you can do that, no problem. But we're not talking about it. Oh, we're talking about something else. If you understand that we're talking about it, then I think you are already uh, in a very good state to understand what this is all about. But again, this is a very difficult subject 
to talk about uh, because it doesn't matter how many times or how long we, we, we stay here talking about this idea of union, this idea of complementary energies, this idea of using your sexual drive to, to energize and to make things happen. In the end, a lot of people will just hear the sex thing. Yeah. Fun, sex, and that's where the big problem lies. And that's where the very sad cases that we hear about happen. So, again, if you are interested in sexual magic, even if you're an adult, go read about it. Talk to your magician friends. Be aware of where you're of where you are getting into. Be smart. Be safe. I know that this is something that you all must have heard time and time again. But this is the way to to be to do it and be safe. Awesome. That's a, a great place to end. Everybody go out and get the book, uh, Buddha on Gnosticism. The <laughs> links are going to be in the, the show notes below. Eduardo, thank you so much for coming on. It, it was an awesome discussion. Oh, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be able to talk to you and to all of you guys listening to us around the world. And please do get the book. Tell me what you think about it. I am active in the social media thing, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Tik. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can say your name. Yeah, no yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 TikTok, all that stuff. You can find me there. Uh, so go, please talk to me. Tell me what you what you thought about the book. No problem if you if you <laughs> have a criticism. It's good. Go talk to me. I would love to hear about it. But I hope that you will. All of you will like the book. <laughs> uh, so, okay, thanks again. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.